A stalemate at OPEC. The cartel just can't agree on production quotas, so they're leaving them just where they are. And look what's happening to the price of oil. It's spiking as a result. You're looking at NYMEX crude there, over $100 a barrel once again. Many say, though, speculators have been in this market driving up the price of oil recently. So does our next guest. He achieved near rock star status back in 2008 when he testified before Congress about speculators and oil. We're joined now by Michael Masters, founder of the hedge fund Masters Capital Management. Welcome to the show, Michael. Thanks, Margaret. So the defense always is that speculators help provide liquidity to the marketplace. But you say there's manipulation right now. How much are you estimating here? Well, what we're really saying is there's there's a concept called excessive speculation. So speculators do provide liquidity to the market up to a point. And after that point, when they dominate the price discovery of the market, then in fact, it's no longer uh, price discovery in the sense of liquidity, it's price discovery in the sense of prices are moving because of their activities. Now, who are these speculators that you are seeing active? Well, uh, years ago, the speculators were traditionally, you know, people that would buy and sell every day, uh, many times a day. Uh, today, things have changed. You've got large institutional investors, pension funds, folks like that that have come in these markets and looked at commodities as an asset class and invested in them. And that's changed this, the structure that's financialized commodities and changed things. Well, people have said that has taken place because of ETS, because of other ways to invest instead of just buying the outright contract itself. But, right. but what you're describing it, with excessive speculation sounds like manipulation. Well, it's, it's not manipulation per se as people's, people sort of classically define the term, mm -hmm. but it's collectively everyone doing the same thing. And when that happens, then the collective actions of those folks actually have a very significant impact on the, on the markets. And for the funds that you run, the three that are under uh, masters, you don't participate in no. the commodity markets themselves, no. but you do invest in companies that obviously can win or lose based on fluctuations Correct. of price of oil, price of gas. Correct. So uh, what are you doing differently than what you did back in 2008? Well, we're just continuing to talk about the issue because we think that the issue still hasn't been solved. Uh, position limits are part of the Dodd-Frank legislation, and the mm -hmm. CFTC right now is looking at those very closely. Uh, but there's still been no actual rulemaking that's been finalized. Right. And so we've advocated position limits because we think that that would help the markets return to sort of their, their, their classical state of having some speculators and having the rest bona fide hedgers. You now, recently in the silver market, uh, we did see... The, the amount of cash, the amount of margin that you have to put up to take that bet increased in a way that made it less affordable, essentially, to make those bets, right. that, to move the, the price of silver. Why do you think that we should broaden that out, or why don't you think that model would work elsewhere? We've never really advocated margin as a, as a, as a tool, and the reason is because it, it disproportionately hurts the smaller speculators versus the larger speculators. The large asset allocators that are going to these commodities, in many cases, they're fully collateralized. So what do you mean with position limits? How so, would that be So position fair? limits have worked for many years, and it wasn't until really the re reduction of position limits and the passage of CF the CFMA where things really change. Position limits effectively limit speculative participation in markets to a certain amount. We've advocated mm -hmm. roughly 30 percent to allow speculators to provide liquidity to the market but not to allow them to dominate price discovery. Now, I know this report that came out of the UN very recently brought focus back on this question of speculation. And we looked at it internally here. One of our reporters actually has a, a screen I want to put up for our viewers right now. And you can see it here on the screen as well. And that's over the past three years, from 2007 through present, uh, price versus speculation. Price being orange, speculation being white there. And you can see that back when you were talking about this in 08 and 07, the price spike speculation was not <laughs> as, as uh, a prominent as the price increase there. Speculation now, while it is up, price is not necessarily mirroring that. That's data on the Bloomberg terminal. Why do you think that this isn't reflecting what you are seeing? Well, it depends. Uh, the UN report, it's, you know, it depends on the data that they're actually using. We've focused on commodity index funds and those flows. Well, that's not the UN report. That's uh, from our Bloomberg terminal. That oh. differs from the UN report, okay. actually. Disproves what the UN was asserting. Okay. Well, um, you know, data is data, and we've used the CFTC data, and our data suggests that the commodity index that funds That is based better. off CFTC data. That, that may be. It's just our data is, is based on one particular segment of the market, which is the commodity index funds. Uh, 
the bottom line is, is in our view, there's been a very significant influence, a very significant correlation between those two. Now, the reality is, is that it doesn't account for everything. There is supply and demand factors in any right. give, a given commodity. And if it was as easy as just suggesting using flows from investors uh -huh. and correlating that to the price, then everybody would be doing that. It, the, the markets are more complex than that. But we're suggesting that there's a very significant causal effect uh, that correlates well to those prices. And you're not alone. I mean, there are prominent investors who say that speculators do, uh, on you know, impact the market in ways that's perhaps not fair. But what is the breakdown specifically? If you're trying to really get a handle on where oil should be priced, what is it that you're factoring in there? 30 percent influence in terms of speculators in the run up? I mean, more than that? Well, I mean, you know, I, I leave that to the experts. But I mean, you know, Goldman Sachs has said it's 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 25 percent. Uh, other people have said it's 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 higher numbers than that. Uh, in my view, uh, you know, it's 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 significant. Um, and I think what's interesting is that, you know, when, when you're up here in, in New York and you talk to money managers behind the scenes, they all know that speculation has a very significant influence on the price. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just that banks that have commodity index businesses, they have large commodity businesses, they don't want to talk about the influence of investors on price in many cases. Uh, and I think that's because uh, they're, they're concerned about, you know, regulatory risk. Well, well, we'll see, as you say, what the CFTC ends up doing with some of these uh, rules that are supposed to be implemented under Dodd-Frank. But uh, it's an interesting viewpoint, Michael. Thank you for sharing it with us.